Okay, so I want to start talking about this idea of proofs. There's actually a lot going on in Chapter 4. Um, Smith throws a lot of stuff out there very quickly. He throws out this idea of proofs, which I'm going to spend this lecture on. There's a lot to say about that. He also throws out this idea of suppressed or missing premises, which people use this fancy Greek term enthymemes for. Um, I'm not going to try to talk about that in this lecture because it's you know it's also a pretty complicated topic and I think you really need this idea of proofs down pretty well before you can talk about enthymemes or suppressed premises so we'll talk about proofs in this fairly long lecture at least by ash standards and we'll talk about this idea of suppressed or missing premises or enthymemes all you know different words for the same thing we'll talk about that in the next lecture all right, so what is a proof? Well, remember last lecture we talked about forms of argument. You know, there are certain forms of argument. If arguments have a certain pattern, we know that they're valid, right? Might talk about valid steps of inference, right? Well, a proof is where we show that an argument uses only valid steps. Every inference, every move in the argument is valid. And if an argument, if every step is valid, then the whole argument is valid. And so what we're trying to do with a proof is to show this. We look at every single step in the argument and we show that it is valid. If we can do that, a proof is one way of showing that, in fact, our argument is valid, right? With short arguments, you don't need to do this. Everything's going to be laid out for you. But a lot of times, you'll see arguments that are gappy, right? There are steps in the argument that you could reach from the premises. And then if you take these steps, they'll let you get to the conclusion. But the argument itself doesn't actually state them. Um, Smith gives a few examples, you know, whatever. Let me give you a new one, right? So, fraudsters are either narcissists or compulsive liars. Compulsive liars have bad parents. Narcissists have bad parents. Sam Bankman Freed is a fraudster. You know, this guy who, like, you know, defrauded all these people of money in cryptocurrency, you know. If you don't know, look him up. It's kind of hilarious. You know, literally, one month they had an article in this guy, not only about him, but, you know, about some people he was bankrolling, about what a great human being he was. You know, the next month he's in handcuffs being thrown in jail, right, for basically stealing money. Sam Bankman's free, Freed's parents were utilitarians. They were utilitarian as a kind of moral philosopher. They think that whatever has the best consequences is the right thing to do. Bankman's Freed's and parents are in fact utilitarians. They train their little boy to be a good utilitarian. Yeah, it didn't work out so well. Right. Part of utilitarianism is that you can break any moral rule if you think it has better consequences to do it. You know, like, if you think you can make even more money by defrauding your clients are using their money in ways that they didn't agree to, or well, you should do it. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's... This guy's a piece of work, as are his parents, apparently, but, you know, we don't need to get into that, right? Just an example, is this a valid argument or not? In fact, it is, but we need to show that, right? So, you know, I don't think it's a sound argument, you know, I'm not sure all fraudsters or narcissists or compulsive liars. Some of them might have something else wrong with them. And again, I'm not sure that they all have bad parents, right? But let's assume it is, right? When we are talking about validity, again, we are not arguing, oh, okay, is this, are these premises true? We're just arguing if they are true, does the conclusion follow? Well, first, 
let's tidy up the argument to use this all some language that we've been using, right? This is a, you know, this form of all some whatever. I think it's, you know, somebody says fraudsters are narcissistic compulsive liars. Compulsive liars have bad parents. Narcissists have bad parents. You know, they're making these categorical statements. They're saying something about what that means is all of these people are like this, right? All fraudsters are narcissists or compulsive liars. All compulsive liars have bad parents. All narcissists have bad parents. All right. You know, is there already, we can see here, a valid form of argument that might get us something that helps to get us closer to our conclusion? You know, this idea of proof, when you're asked to do one, I won't ask you guys to do very complex ones. Probably will have you guys do a few and really short informal ones on the exam. But, you know, you don't try to jump to your conclusion all at once. There are gaps. You know, already the argument jumps. You want to start filling in the gaps. Think of it as a puzzle, right? What could I, what do I see here that's already valid that might get me closer to my conclusion? Well, think about this. You know, we had this form of argument, all F or either G or H, all G or K, all H or K. So all F or K, right? All fraudsters are narcissistic compulsive liars. Compulsive liars have bad parents. Narcissists have bad parents. So if we look at this, plug this in, you know, compulsive liars are A, F, narcissist G, all G, R, K, that is people who have bad parents. All H or K, that is people who have bad parents. Well, all F, conveniently fraudsters, are people who have bad parents, right? So, we can use our valid form of argument to add a new premise, right? Anytime with a proof, anytime you introduce a new premise, you have to cite some rules from the previous premises to show that it follows from them, right? All fraudsters have bad parents. You know, valid form of argument. We're citing the statements that let us help ourselves to this premise, right? We're citing the rules. We're citing the premises that let us do this, right? One, two, three, right? Well, so now we say all fraudsters have bad parents. Well, is there something here that would let us get closer to our conclusion? Think about it, right? Step by step. Don't try to do it all at once. So we have Bankman Freed as a fraudster. We have all fraudsters have bad parents. What could we get if we put those two together? Well, we could get Sam Bankman Freed has bad parents, right? And we cite the lines, the premises that let us get this conclusion. Four, he's a fraudster. Six, all fraudsters have bad parents. That's what justifies us in saying seven here, right? One more step. We don't need to add anything, but we do need to show what premises justify our conclusion. Think about it for a second. Which ones are those? Look at the ones that mention utilitarians and bad parents. Connect those two together. How might it work? Right? You know, if he's a utilitarian and he has bad, it, 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 sorry, if he had bad parents and his parents were utilitarians, then at least some utilitarians are bad parents, right? Now this is, you know, one thing I'll say here, and this is actually kind of hard for people, but it's worth keeping in mind. You know, I've already mentioned this, I think, but you know, when we say some in logic, 
what we mean by that is at least one, right? When we're using this logical language of validity, you know, we often lose some detail from ordinary language. We want to be very precise with it. You know, if I say some in real life, if I say, well, some students in my class are failing, and you say, you know, I shouldn't tell you this, it'd be a FERPA violation. If you ask me and I say, well, who? And I say, well, just Billy. And you're like, well, that's only one. You know, some makes me think more than one, right? Look, logic is more finicky about it. As long as it's at least one, then it's some. In this very literal, you know, it's implied if we say some, it's more than one. But logic uses very, very literal language. All right, so moving on. Now, Smith talks about this idea of a reductio ad absurdum, this indirect way of proving something. And, you know, he gives a couple examples, but I think he could do a lot better job explaining this. So I want to talk a lot more about this. Um, this is used a lot in logic. You know, you'll see this in math. Like, this is bread and butter if you ever take a higher level math class. This is a really, really common form of argument in mathematical proofs. But, you know, we also use this in day-to-day -day life. I don't think that the idea here, when you see it, it can seem crazy or counterintuitive. When you actually think about it, I think it's not, and I think it's pretty common in day-to-day -day life. So how does a reductio, you know, Latin, logic uses a lot of Latin, I don't know why, I mean, I guess some logic was developed in the Middle Ages where speaking Latin was how you proved you were smart, right? You know, you have all these medieval philosophers who always wrote in Latin, you know, even among some educated people, right, you know, it's still a way of showing that you're smart, but whatever. Anyway. What reductio ad absurdum means is basically reduction to the absurd, or it means that if you assume something, this one claim, then it would also show that something we know to be false is true, so we should reject the first claim. That might seem super abstract to you, and you might be like, oh my god, what in the world does this mean? Let me give you an example. If we want to prove something, it's indirect because we don't, you know, directly try to prove our claim. What we do, though, is we assume that the opposite or the negation of the claim is true, and then we show that something stupid or crazy follows from the negation. Let me give you guys an example of how this might work in everyday life. Or in this actually work. This is from a philosopher. You know, Immanuel Kant, he takes this hardcore line on lying, and people show, you know, that he's wrong about this. He says it's never okay to lie, right? Most of us would say it is sometimes morally acceptable to lie. We want to prove that it is sometimes okay to lie. So we assume the negation of this. It is never morally acceptable to lie, you know. And we might rephrase this if we want to put it closer to this all or some talk we've been using. We might say all lies are morally wrong. Well, suppose all lies are morally wrong. We just help ourselves to that. We're supposing it for the sake of argument. Answering a Nazi's question about whether there are Jews hiding in one's house untruthfully is a lie. You know. You know, imagine, you know, we see this in movies, this happened actually in World War II some. The Nazis, the Gestapo, come to your door. You are hiding people in your house, Jews or other people they want to kill. And they start asking you questions. If you don't answer those questions truthfully, you are lying. If, it, if all lies are morally wrong, then it not answering this Nazi's questions truthfully, answering them untruthfully is morally wrong. But that's crazy. None of us think that if the Gestapo came to someone's door who was hiding Jews and said, you know, are you hiding Jews in your house? They would have to say, 
you got me. Yeah, they're they're under the floorboards. Sorry, right? That would be a stupid, crazy thing. We all think that this person should lie through their teeth. Or even if you knew your neighbor, maybe you aren't brave enough to do it, even if you knew your neighbor was the person hiding people from the Nazis, you shouldn't be like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You should lie, right? So, since this claim that all lies are morally wrong commits us to this stupid result, sit there, stand there, tell the truth to Mr. Nazi, we know it is not true that all lies are morally wrong. We suppose, for the sake of argument, that it's always wrong to lie. We get a stupid result. So that shows us that it is, in fact, the negation of it is always wrong to lie. It is not always wrong to lie, which means, in other words, it is sometimes okay to lie, right? This is a really common form of argument. I mean, it's not going to be as, you know, as regimented, as rule-based, um, as you see in Smith, but this pops up in our moral reasoning, this pops up in the way that judges reason about the law, right? You know, famous Supreme Court decision, this guy claimed that alcoholism was a disability, and he won an exception because, you know, he didn't take advantage of his veterans' benefits for an education soon enough because he was an alcoholic, the VA made an exception for disability. It didn't make an exception for being an alcoholic or a drug addict. And the Supreme Court, you know, rejected his claim. Why? Because they said, well, if we start treating drug addiction or alcoholism like a disability, we'll have to do all this stuff that would be completely crazy, right? You know, would we have to make accommodations at work the way we do for people who are in wheelchairs, for people who are alcoholics. I don't know what that would look like. You know, if we tried to do that, if we thought it through consistently, it would start to look crazy, right? So the Supreme Court said, even though we feel sorry for this guy, even though in a better world he would have gotten to use his veterans' benefits, we can't treat alcoholism or addiction like we do other disabilities because we couldn't accept these results. They would be crazy, right? You see this all the time in legal reasoning. You see this all the time in moral reasoning, right? Anyway, so what he's doing is just making more explicit, more rule-bound something that we already do, right? So let's see how this works, though, in these sort of more rule-bound explicit proofs. Let me give you guys an example. No philosopher is illogical. This is one of the exercises, right? Jones keeps making argumentative mistakes. No logical person keeps making argumentative mistakes. All existentialists are philosophers, so Jones is not an existentialist. which is, you know, we put it in numbered form with the premise at the, or the conclusion at the end. Makes it easier. We need to do that for our proof. We need to have our step premises laid out so we can, you know, be clear what we're drawing on in each step. And we take our steps, right? So, I'm not going to do this the slow walk step by step by step by step by step that I did before, but you know, we can use this reductio argument here, right? One through four are our premises. Well, when I introduce any new claim, I need to cite some premises. So, you know, you could do this later. It doesn't matter the order. But we need to make explicit that Jones is not a logical person, right? Two says he keeps making mistakes, an argument. Three says, well, logical people don't do that. So Jones is not a logical person. Now we go into our argument that uses the reductio, that gets a contradiction. You know, when you do this in logic, you know, when you do this in everyday life, you kind of just draw on stuff that we all know to be false. In logic, 
you know, you have to be explicit. You have to have it in his explicit claim. You know, you can't just assume stuff, right? Well, generally, like, we'll talk about, you know, assuming something in a second, but you can't just, you know, make, you know, sh assume that a claim is true and help yourself to it, right? Anyway, so, six, suppose Jones is an existentialist, and this is just a supposition. Now, what a supposition means is, let us assume for the sake of argument that a claim is true. We're not saying that it is true, but we're saying, well, we'll assume it is for the sake of argument. You're not helping yourself to this claim. You're just saying, well, imagine it's true and let's see what would follow from it. So let's take six as true that he's an existentialist and let's see what that would commit us to. Well, if Jones is an existentialist, then he's a philosopher, because we already said all existentialists are philosophers. So, seven from four and five. All existentialists are philosophers. Or, sorry, four and six. So, given the premise that we've assumed, that we've supposed for the sake of argument, and this all existentialists are philosophers, we get this claim that he's a philosopher, number seven, four and six. Well, well, you know, no philosopher is illogical. So if Jones is a philosopher, then Jones is not illogical from one and seven. You know, Jones is a logical person. You know, we'll talk about this rule. It's called double negation. If we say he's not illogical, it's a way of saying he's logical. But we want to be very, very, very careful. Very small steps. Be explicit about what we're doing in each. So if he's not illogical, then he's logical. So from seven. Well, so nine says that he is logical. Well, five says that he's not. We have a contradiction. Five and nine contradict each other. Something we know to be true, number five, from our other premises, would be contradicted by something that would be true if we suppose that he's an existentialist. Well, Imagining that he's an existentialist, assuming that he is, leads to a contradiction, so it cannot be true, so we have to reject it. That's our reductio ad absurdum, lines 6 through 10. You know, there are other ways to do this proof. If you go look at um, Smith's explanations, one way that he does it is the way I've done it with the reductio ad absurdum, another way he uses a different method of cracking it. And look, this is going to be true for proofs. You know, there are there are different strategies t to doing a proof, right? Different ways will justify your conclusion. There's not one right way to do these. You know, use whatever method works for you the strategy that is the right one is the one that works for you as far as I'm concerned. I just did it this way to show you how you might use this reductio ad absurdum, how this might work, this idea of indirect proof. You don't have to do it this way. Here's another one you could use this reductio one for. Either the butler or the cook committed the murder. The victim died of poison if the cook was the murderer. The butler carried out the murder only if the victim was stabbed. The victim didn't die from poison, so the victim was stabbed. Let's put this in our numbered form, right? Either the butler or the cook committed the murder. The victim died from poison if the cook was the murderer. The butler carried out the murder only if the victim was stabbed. The victim didn't die from poison, so the victim was stabbed. All right. 
So to crack this one, the first thing we would need to do, look, look at this. If we can show the butler did it, then the victim was stabbed. If the butler did it, the victim was stabbed. That's what number three is saying in a very wordy way, right? So how would we show that the victim was in fact, the butler in fact did it? Well, if we could show the cook didn't do it, then we could show the butler did it, right? So, and this highlights something, you know, with proofs, you often want to work backwards, you know, from your conclusion to see how you get there, right? So, either the butler or the cook committed the murder, the victim died from poison if the cook was the murderer, the butler carried out the murder only if the victim was stabbed, the victim didn't die from poison. Those are the premises we have, right? So, let's, you know, we want to show that the cook didn't do it. So to do that, we'll show that if we assume the cook did it, we get a contradiction, we get an absurd claim, we get a claim that we know to be false. It's not hard, right? Suppose the cook did it. We just assume that for the sake of argument. Then the murder was carried out by poison. Two says, if the cook did it, the murder was carried out by poison. For five, we're supposing that the cook did do it. That gets us a contradiction. Four says the victim wasn't poisoned. Six says he was. So assuming the cook did it gets us this reductio you know, five through seven. So the cook did not do it, right? So we still haven't gotten our conclusion, but we're pretty close. Well, if the cook did not do it, our number eight that we got by using this reductio strategy, then the butler did it, right? Number nine, one and eight, the butler did it one more step and we have a valid proof here you know we just need to add what we're drawing on to reach our conclusion well we're drawing on three and nine from three and nine right three if the butler did it the victim was stabbed nine the butler did it you know we know the butler did it because it was him or the cook we've already established it's not the cook so the victim was stabbed. Now let's look at one more of the exercises. J just because this exercise, this is another thing that I think Smith goes through way too quickly. You know, I mean this is common in math and logic books to introduce important ideas in the exercises, but I really think he should highlight this one a bit more. And this is a way of proving something called proof by cases. When you have an either or statement, if you show, you know, you know that one thing or the other is true, well, if you can show that either one of them will reach your conclusion, you know, you're on one road or the other, both roads, if both roads lead to your conclusion, then you know the argument's valid. You do this through something that's called proof by cases. And this one in the exercise uses these proof by cases. Jack is useless at logic or he simply isn't ready for the exam. Either he will fail the exam or he is not useless at logic. Either it's wrong that he won't fail the exam or he is ready for it, so he will fail. Now look, this argument looks like a mess. You know, you know, looks, you know, I look at this and I get the feeling of like knotted up thread, right? You know, it's it's hard to know which way which piece goes which way, right? But let's put this in these forms of premises with the conclusion and we can use this proof by cases strategy to show that this works. He's useless at logic or he's not ready for the exam. Either he'll fail the exam or he's not useless at logic. Either it's wrong that he won't fail the exam or he's ready for it so he will fail. Let's make explicit why this is valid. Look. And don't get intimidated by these. These are more complicated. These are more tricky. I just want you to see how this works. I'm not going to give you guys anything this complicated on an exam. 
1. Jack, so 1 through 4, or sorry, 1 through 3 are what we already have, right? All these either or statements. So let's take one. We know that one of two things is true. Either he's useless at logic or he's not ready. So let's assume the first of these. If he's useless at logic, well, does that show he's going to fail? Well, in fact, it does. Suppose Jack is useless at logic, then he will fail. Look at two. Either he will fail the exam or he isn't useless at logic. If he is useless at logic, we know one of these two things has to be true. So that leaves us with the other one. He will fail. So we get our result pretty quickly if we assume that he is useless at logic. Six, if he's useless at logic, he will fail from four and five. Now let's take the other part of this either or. Suppose that he isn't ready for the exam. Well, three says either he's ready for the exam or it's wrong, he won't fail. Well, if he isn't ready for the exam, that leaves us with this other thing that has to be true, either or, then it's wrong, he won't fail the exam from three and seven, that's our number eight. So Jack will fail. You know, look, we're saying it's wrong that he won't fail. This is using this double negation stuff, which we'll talk about later. But I hope that, you know, just intuitively, kind of naturally, you can see if I say, well, it's wrong, he won't fail. That's a roundabout way of saying he will fail, right? If Jack isn't ready, he will fail. You know, seven through nine. gets us 11. If he's useless at logic or he simply isn't ready, he will fail. You know, 6 says if he's useless, he will fail. 10 says if he isn't ready, he will fail. 12, he will fail, right? Because 1 says he's either useless at logic or unprepared. 11 says, well, if he's unprepared or useless at logic, either one, he will fail. So that gets us our conclusion. Look, there's a lot going on here, but I just want to introduce this idea of proof by cases, make it more explicit than Smith does, because it really is an important strategy, an important way of trying to solve these proofs. Look, I know there's a lot going on here, but hopefully by working through the exercises and practicing, this will become a little bit clearer.